Okay, so for our last panel discussion for, on ensuring a healthy science outlook, I'd like to invite Jeremy Farrar, Charlie Rice and Mariam Kleissen to join me back on stage, please. Thank Jeremy, you. let me s s start with you. You were, before you became chief scientist at the World Health Organization, no, please, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> we, you, need to be, you need to be healthy, so, no. But before you became chief scientist at the World Health Organization, you were head of the Wellcome Trust in the UK. Um, that gave you a particular perspective over organizing science, organi science structures. So I'd be interested to know what you, what, what, what you think about this idea of preparing for success? Because <laughs> that was a theme that we've just been discussing. And how does an organization prepare for success? Hmm. Yeah, very interesting question. So um, just to go back a little bit before welcome. So um, like many here, I've, I've seen it from being a clinical scientist in Vietnam for 20 years. I've seen it as, yes, head of welcome for a decade. And now I've seen it in the World Health Organization for 15 or 16 months. And I suppose my, re my reflection through that time, and Charlie may disagree with this, is, is as a community, scientific community, I think we don't prepare for success anywhere near well enough. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, during the 1990s in Vietnam, I was involved in the development of uh, artemisinin combination therapies for malaria. Uh, this came out of a Chinese herbal drug uh, um, development program that happened during the Vietnam War. We knew the evidence for that, a little bit like Ola was saying, at the end of the 1990s. But we did not prepare the world for the success of that. And as a result, we wasted 10 years and before those therapies became available to everybody. A little bit like happened in COVID, mm. where the world was unequally uh, accessible to the COVID vaccines. And I think we need to anticipate, uh, as was said earlier, we don't have a crystal ball. But we can anticipate trends, demographic shifts. We can anticipate where, uh, as we heard earlier, where, where, where gene therapies for sickle and others are going to happen. If we do not anticipate, the rich world will get them, and the less rich world will get them much later. And if we are going to use science to reduce inequalities around the world, anticipation becomes so much more important. Mm. As always, it's a question of where you put your resources and what you concentrate on. And I mean, this is this is in part implementation science, which I know is a theme that you're very interested in, Mariam. How it, but it, it requires people to commit to funding implementation science and really working out the scenarios. And do you want to speak yeah, a bit about that? I, I'd really want to make a plea for implementation science, as you said. Because for the world to benefit from all the discoveries that we talk about here, the new innovations, new products, drugs, vaccines, the end to end from discovery to the end is not from discovery to market. It's from discovery to the end user and those who need it the most. And if we change that vision that it's about reaching those who need these discoveries the most, we have to ask the question, not just what, or why, but how? And for me, implementation science has answered the questions, how do we get these ideas to those who need it the most? And that would shorten the line you talked about from discovery to end users. Mm. And do you feel that is something that is very under, poorly understood at the moment? I think it's threatened right now. We, we, you know, we see a reduction in development aid. We see a reduction not just of the whole pie, but the slice of the pie that goes into research. And I think we should take for granted that if we care as investors or whether we are dom producing domestic resources or bilateral aid or multilateral aid, we want to make sure that we have the greatest impact for the society of the investments we make. And then we have to have a share that goes into research to answer these critical questions about how well are we doing, are we reaching those we need to reach, and it's again the how questions. Mm. I'd be interested to hear you all talk about this, uh, th this question of why that isn't more to the fore. You would have thought it was the, the, it was the end that everybody was after, that would be the point at which you'd say yes we've succeeded, but are people feeling that they've succeeded earlier and just taking their eye off the ball? What is the, what's the underlying problem? I'm interested in Charlie's view of this as well. I, I, 
I think one of the issues we do have in, in again, the, the broad scientific community, and, and I think this is reflected in our academic institutions, some are getting better, um, and that is the fragmentation and the vertical structures that we have in our systems. And, and if you heard, uh, what I took away from today is just the breadth of scientific expertise we've heard about, from breathing to sleep to, to everything in between. And, and we've got to find better ways of working at the interfaces between disciplines. And I think our structures almost prevent us doing that at the moment, including in our academic institutions. Charlie, do you want to come in on this? Well, I think, you know, science health is, you know, something that we should all be, you know, sort of very concerned about. And uh, sort of taking science and improving public health, incredibly important. And I think the, uh, you know, obviously money is important in terms of getting science done. It's important to really have, I think, a, a balance of uh, sort of different activities that have to do with science and sort of the translation of science to, to improving health. And, um, you know, one of the things I think that, and we, we've heard about this in terms of, you know, what's important um, in a career is also, you know, sort of what's important in science. And, and in some of the great sort of discoveries and breakthroughs in science are, are unanticipated, unplanned for, just driven by sort of curiosity-driven science. And um, I think it's very important to, you know, sort of have a balance of, uh, you know, sort of the, the sort of discovery, the, the, the sort of free curiosity-driven discovery, and then choosing among those sort of findings to decide which of them are going to have an impact on really sort of translating scientific discoveries into improving human health. And, you know, sort of finding a, you know, sort of a balance for that is, is always a little bit challenging because I think people want to see, you know, sort of improve, tangible improvements, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, it, I'm just, I'm, I was just reflecting that in a way we've got the perfect group to solve this here because we've got basic science leading to public health and in the middle somebody who's been in all world, in all of these worlds. So please, solve it. <laughs> Just on that to Charlie, and Drew said it earlier when, when, he, when he said, how long did it take you to do the vaccine? And I think the answer Drew was 15 minutes. Um, it, we should just remind ourselves that was 15 minutes built on 30 years of investment in discovery science. And one of the shifts we're seeing at the moment around the, around the world uh, in the public funding for science is that it's driven by what Charlie talks about increasingly to, to breakthroughs. Mm. Breakthroughs come through curiosity-driven, um, independent science, which people can't be sure where, it, where it's growing. We heard about sleep earlier, and, and I learned today about how the fruit fly sleeps, and it's very similar to how a human sleeps. You know, that wouldn't necessarily guide you to an intervention tomorrow, and yet it's absolutely critical research. So as societies uh, evolve how they support science, making sure we make the case that discovery However, your social science is biomedical, implemented, but discovery remains absolutely critically important. Mm. And that's clearly why in financing there are some who are willing to take risks, which I think is very important. We have to be able to take risks and not undermine basic science and the surprises, the things we can't anticipate. At the same time, we can already now make certain anticipations about things and with some degree of predictive value and say that, you know, it's not if we are going to get another pandemic, but when and how, and not to have learned something, for example, from the current one that makes us better prepared for the future one. I think that is a loss to society. So I think, yes, the discourse and the questions need to come across the continuum again from basic to implementation science, but to really take the perspectives of the most vulnerable population groups who are the one who's going to suffer the most also into the future and taking that perspective and see how we can ensure that we don't do our science at the expense of actually reaching those. Absolutely. I, I, I'm just very interested to know how you think we should, should combat the fragmentation. I mean, it, 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 I'm so often with laureates who advocate, of obviously, for the need for foundational basic research and other things too, but that's one thing. You, you public health experts who campaign for, mm. yes, a broad, a broad minded approach, but also for the implementation side of things. How do you combat fragmentation? Hmm. 
You, see, you, all, you all nodded when I asked <laughs> yeah. the question, but I need an answer. <laughs> it's a tough one. We have talked a bit about that because the fragmentation runs through all the things we do from academic science to actually in the implementation world. And there's great, it's not a zero sum game. No. Um, you need the depth of knowledge and the expertise that goes with those vertical structures. But we increasingly, as again Ola demonstrated in, in the wonderful slides, we increasingly live in a horizontal world. And somehow, I think we have to encourage that confidence and humility of working at interfaces um, if we're going to drive that sort of activity. I was lucky enough um, in a previous life to spend about a month a year at, at Princeton working with Brian Grenfell, who's an ecologist. Um, but he worked at the interfaces between multiple different disciplines, from mathematics to ecology to how locusts flew around the world and indeed pandemics and epidemics. And, and that was a wonderful environment for that, those interfaces, which uh, is not unique, but it was a very special environment. Mm -hmm. But when it comes... Sorry. I was going to say, I think the funders have got a responsibility here. Mm -hmm. um, and you go back to risk, and one of my concerns, uh, and I think it's a role for philanthropy, um, is that I think public funding is increasingly taking fewer risks. You know, if you look at R01 grants to the National Institutes of Health, the, the, the success rate is falling, and you're finding reasons to not fund a grant, whereas often there'll be brilliant things in there that you want to get funded. Somehow we need to make sure we've got the right balance between risk-taking within our academic institutions and the ability to get funding for them. Just to focus on that, what is the reason for risk averseness increasing in those funding decisions? I don't know. I mean, it, it is sort of a dismaying trend. <laughs> Um, because I think, you know, sort of we need to take risks to sort of make progress and, and discover sort of new things. And uh, this has been sort of an ongoing mm -hmm. problem, I think, with the, with the gr sort of grant system that you, you basically have to, you know, claim that you're going to cure cancer or something, right? Otherwise, you know, people won't necessarily fund your idea. And I think things that are sort of more high-risk, high-reward uh, really are having a difficult time um, getting funded. And that, that is really uh, a shame. Um, I'm not sure the best way to, to fix it, uh, because again, you don't really want to be, you know, only funding grants where the outcome is pretty much assured or almost already accomplished. I mean, you want to be funding things that are sort of new and that are going to break new ground. Mm. So I think we have to you know, sort of change our sort of mentality a little bit about, you know, sort of what we, what we consider to fund. And I, I think the other thing that is an issue in terms of just providing the driver for sort of basic science is that we really need to have sort of a sustained funding yeah. base. You know, one of the problems I think that we face is this sort of awful and amazing sort of, you know, oscillating cycle. And uh, we certainly saw that in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, where you, know, you would think a global experience like this would elevate the interest in entities to you know, sort of do what it takes to be prepared for the next pandemic. And uh, I, I think we're seeing exactly the opposite happening in the United States, mm -hmm. programs that were sort of established to sort of make some progress and come up with broad spectrum antiviral drugs or, uh, you know, sort of vaccines that are going to be more universal, like you sort of Drew mentioned, uh, we're seeing that uh, actually having a, a tougher time being supported. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, that's true on a national scale. I mean, it's also true on a global scale. And the, the reason it's particularly worrisome is that I think that uh, our young scientists who are going to be the drivers of doing this in the future are not stupid. You know, they're, yeah. they're going to be looking at this and, and saying, you know, is this really sort of a sustainable career? Or am I going to sort of go on this path and then find out, you know, sort of a year from now, I don't have any funding to do my science? And that is, sorry, yes. Yeah, I, I was thinking around the traction of finance years into research, whether it's domestic funding, government or private money. 
I think that someone wise have said that the more you are able to co-create, co-design with those who are likely to actually benefit from the research you do, the more likely you are is to get the ownership in the investment in research. I think also trying to think more about how we bring in stakeholders into our research. And, and, and that's of course obvious when you're dealing with adolescent mental health because young people will say nothing about us without us. So there you have to bring in, because it's not about supplying but actually using the findings and, and, and having a vested interest in the research that we are talking about. But presumably it's such a difficult balance because in some cases, yes, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's obvious, mm -hmm. but in other cases, bringing in the stakeholders also perhaps changes the, the, the ability to take risks, to, to be brave. It, it, it's, I mean, if, for instance, if, if you're wanting governments involved in making research decisions that are very basic, you, you, that, that's a dangerous combination, perhaps. I don't know what you think. Yeah, when, um, the first day, I, I think when I, and I was about two or three weeks ago, I was fortunate or honoured to join the, the Swedish Research Council's group together and discuss the, how, how you strategise around a futures funding scenario. I, I think we have to think in our public funding how we allocate our resources to different aspects to ensure that it doesn't all get uh, homogenised, as, as Charlie uh, w was, was saying earlier. Um, and that may mean allocating a certain amount of your overall um, annual budget for for a slightly different approach to funding, yeah. rather than thinking that one model will fit everything. And I think the US is fortunate because it has a more plural system. Um, because you have the public sector, you have the greater private sector investment, you also have a lot of philanthropy, and I think that more plural system gives you the, the variation you need in your funding, because there shouldn't just be a monopoly to the way that funding is done, I think. Oh. And just to close, you're all advocates, Everybody in this room, in a way, is an advocate. How, what would you advocate for to, to ensure a healthy science ad, uh, outlook? Very brief. Implementation research being part of the, the toolbox that you have in order to get discoveries to the end user. Tell our stories better. And secondly, everyone in this room, although you may not feel it, has got power and advocacy. Mm. Don't just say nice words at the meeting. What are you doing <laughs> in the next 12 months? What are you going to do when you leave the room? That's the responsibility that comes with power. And particularly since you're now prepared for success. Thank you. Yes. Well, I, I think if, if a concluding statement, the sort of health of science, um, I do think we need to do a better job of sort of communicating the benefits of science to the public and mm -hmm. trying to sort of get back to, um, you know, sort of the belief in facts or at least things that are well supported by experimental data. And, you know, that's a, a, a challenge. I, I think the other thing is that sort of just listening today to all of the different components that are at play in terms of individual health and global health and how these things interact, this is an immensely complicated problem. And uh, I don't know if we've gotten the answer today, but one thing that is sort of on my mind is, you know, sort of given all these challenges, you know, what as individuals can we do to sort of contribute to make things better? Uh, it's, it, the, the options are kind of bewildering, um, uh, but um, I think it's worth thinking about and, uh, you know, trying to, to play a positive role in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy.